This week, we're taking issue with some big election results in some smallish places. In New York, the Democrats have eaten into the GOP majority in the House a little bit more. In the town of Milton, they voted on whether to comply with the MBTA communities law. And we have an impeachment in the House, finally. I'm Corey. I'm Matt. And I'm Sue. And this is Taking Issue. Our nation was born here, not with a whimper, but with the spark of revolution. One more indictment, and this election is closed out. That's what democracy is. It's a choice of the people, by the people, and for the people. Hello and welcome to another edition of Taking Issue. We appreciate you being here as always. I am joined by NBC10 Boston political reporter Matt Pritchard and NBC10 Boston political commentator and my ad issue co-host Sue O'Connell. A lot to get to today and we are going to start in Milton where I believe Matt is joining us from. A big vote earlier this week on whether the town should comply with the MBTA communities law which basically in a nutshell and correct me if I'm wrong Matt says if your town, your city gets serviced by the MBTA, then you have to zone for multifamily housing. The goal, of course, to bring more affordable housing and to allow people to live in and around the greater Boston while still having access to transportation. Matt, how did this vote turn out? Uh, and as you were talking to voters on the yes side and the no side, what were their arguments? Uh, this really turned into a divisive issue in this, like you said, Corey, sort of a small town in the midst of the big city here in Milton. Ultimately, voters decided not to comply with the MBTA community's law, voting no on a plan that had been previously approved, but a robust signature campaign made it so that there would be a special election. It was supposed to be on Tuesday, and then it got pushed because of a snow forecast, and it happened on Wednesday, and ultimately Thursday is when we're seeing the fallout from all of this. State officials, of course, are pushing back uh, hard on this and saying that housing is the number one priority for the Commonwealth, trying to make it so everyone can afford to have housing while they are living here in Massachusetts, and that this is just standing in the way of that happening. But when I was talking with voters, specifically those uh, that were planning to vote no, they felt like that this zoning plan did not actually take into account what the city of Milton's uh, situation actually looks like. They felt like a lot of these units would be far away from the transit that they do have. And on top of that, they were saying the transit that Milton has is not the rapid transit that the state seems to think they do have. They obviously have the Mattapan trolley and you can take that. It's part of the red line. You can get onto the T and into Boston from there. But they say that it only holds 38 people and that that should not be counted as something that uh, is public transit for everyone to utilize and get into Boston on a day to day basis. But on the yes side of the coin, of course, they feel like this is their role to play, that they need to come into compliance, that they don't want to lose state funding. On top of that, they don't want to get sued by Attorney General Andrea Campbell. So there's a lot to take in here from these two perspectives. And really the question now is, where do we go from here and what does the conversation look like? So when Sue and I were talking about this, um, and as I, was, as I was watching your reporting yesterday, it seems, it seems so clear cut, yes or no, but it wasn't yes or no, we want this affordable housing to come near the commuter or the, the, the station, per se. It's, do we, want, do we want to comply with the law, yes or no? I know you had the one soundbite with a woman who was like, I hope, I just don't want us to get sued. And the, the consequences of this vote, ultimately, as we've heard from uh, AG Andrea Campbell and from uh, Governor Healy, is that if you don't comply with this law, you will get sued and we, we could potentially keep state funding from you. Was there any real concern about those consequences, Matt? I mean, on the yes side of the coin, I think, yes, they all felt like these are real consequences that will come down on them. On the no side of the coin, they felt like we're, we're not trying to say that we don't want housing. We're not trying to say that we don't want to comply. What we're saying is, is we think the plan that's been put forward here is wrong for the city of Milton. And so what we want to do is have conversations with the Healy Driscoll administration, with the attorney general, and try and come to a compromise where they think it would work better or at least would fit more into the parameters of what this law actually says. They think they should be responsible for less units because, again, they feel like they're not. Uh, power up suits. <laughs> Uh, sign there from our uh, photographer Sean Callahan on his phone. Anyway, um, the, the the point of the matter is 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 they feel like that conversations need to happen uh, more with officials, and they can come up with a plan that fits Milton better. So I don't think they really feel those 
uh, sort of consequences that might come their way on the no side of the coin. They want to have conversations. They want to make something happen. And some of the statements that have come out since the vote, specifically with the Healy administration's Secretary of Housing, seems, seems like they're willing to have that conversation. But in the meantime, those consequences are real and they could really uh, have an impact here in Milton. So before we get to Sue, just want to add a little bit of, of some background here, because uh, other than, than Matt's you know, great reporting on this over the last uh, couple of days this week, uh, Shirley Leung, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right, a Globe columnist who lives in Milton, wrote uh, an article following the vote, which you know the no side won. And she talked about how everything was fine or, or looking like it was fine. You know, in December, the town had had that approved a new zoning plan that would have permitted, and these are her words, at least 2,461 new units of multifamily housing. Far fewer units are expected to get built, but the fur over the plan and the fears of increased congestion, lower property values, obscured a key element of the debate. The town is only required to devise new zoning, not approve new developments. The town still has a role in deciding what gets built. That's the column from Shirley Young. Sue, is, is this as simply, simple as a case of nimbyism as, as some ha have made it, or is there real um, concerns and valid concerns from the folks on, on, on the no side, again, who did not vote to just kill any sort of zoning plan, but voted to say we are not going to comply with Massachusetts law? I mean, Corey, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a little bit of both, right? I mean, to the points and to the reporting that Matt has been doing as well as others. And Shirley's point, it's a complicated issue. I wouldn't exactly call that, that one trolley that runs periodically through the day as a major hub. But at the same time, we keep talking about wanting to expand the MBTA. The Boston Globe also printed the map of what the original MBTA plan was and how these sub suburbs have beaten back uh, getting the train lines extended and how expensive it now is. So uh, they're sort of their own worst enemy and saying, well, you know, this train line isn't a real train line, but we don't necessarily want a real train line because then we'd have to build this housing. And, you know, but to the point, 38 people every now and then on the train doesn't necessarily dictate that we need massive housing. The law doesn't distinguish between that. I don't know if picking a fight immediately with the attorney general to get sued is, is the route to go here. But at the same time, look at housing. How often do we have to talk about how housing is a problem in Massachusetts? If the people of Milton don't want to build more housing, where are their adult children going to live if they want to stay in Milton? Where are they going to live if they want to stay in the greater Boston area? So again, this wasn't a fight about building. This was just a fight, fight about changing the zoning. And so, again, to, to quote Shirley Leung in, in her, her column uh, today on uh, th uh, Thursday, that let's hope that this doesn't mean they're going to get sued by the state and have to do something, but this means they can come to the table and come up with a compromise that both serves the concerns, the legitimate concerns people have, about um, about uh, the the zoning change, but also addresses the fact that we need more housing. I mean, you know, I have a fear that in a hundred years people are going to look back at this housing discussion in Massachusetts as the same way we look at people who thought asbestos was a good idea. We see the problem; we have to fix it. Yeah, and I think it's it's interesting because we have seen other cities and towns comply with this law some doing sort of the, the, the bare minimum that the, that the law is asking for. And then other places have said, no, we want to go well above and beyond, um, you know, what the MBTA community, community's law requires. Matt, do you get any sort of sense that, you know, and in, in, in Shirley's column, she talked about it's time to put down the yard signs and, and get to work on, on devising this plan. Do you think there is going to be that sort of good faith effort to, to figure this out and ultimately come into compliance with the law? Or... Could you foresee or did you hear any talk of, no, let's just keep thumbing our nose and whatever comes, comes, we'll wrap it up in court cases and, th and things like that? I think it's a good question. I mean, as I was talking with different voters, I think I heard both of those things. I heard legitimate no voters who were saying, we need to go back to the table. We need to find something that would work better for Milton on a day-to-day -day basis. But then I also heard people who said, we can't afford to be building all of these housing. We can't afford to be paying for other people X, Y, and Z. And so you can sort of see the divide there when it comes, at least on the no side of the coin. I mean, the yes side of the coin is pretty simple, right? You want to be in compliance. We think housing is important, this, that, and the other. 
But the no side of the coin is a little bit more complicated. And I think it's going to be interesting to see, you know, if all those people who came out and voted no, if they're going to support having a productive conversation about finding a compromise, because if they don't think there should be a compromise, well, then what they voted for is not what they're getting. So it is, it's, it's a complicated issue. And as you drive around here, I mean, the yard signs, every other house has a different answer and everybody's waving to each other because they all know each other here. And so it sort of has divided the town along this yes, no line on whether or not to build all of this housing to add all of these cars and add all of these people into this really small town again in the midst of Boston. Last thing I'll ask you, Sue, do you foresee other towns perhaps, and I'm not sure how, how many other towns there are that still need to come into compliance, but do, do you foresee any other towns taking the Milton route and saying, well, hey, wait a second, if Milton can say no to this and, and maybe not get the consequences that the governor and the AG's office are promising, well, why can't we do it? Yeah, well, I think that's exactly why we're seeing Andrea Campbell, the attorney general, and Moore Healy, who used her campaign funds to try and, 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 and urge people to vote yes on this. There will be a big stick on this, right? So uh, I'm not sure this is the fight that Milton wanted to fight, but I guarantee you that the attorney general and the governor are going to use the full faith and credit to come down on Milton to either come to the table to negotiate this or to definitely put as many sanctions and whatever else fines, whatever the stick is, on them to keep other cities and towns from thinking that they could do it. So it's a big risk on, on the, uh, the Milton side. I'm, I'm sad they couldn't come to some sort of um, agreement before it came to this, but it's also, it, to your point, Corey, this is going to be a fight that cities and towns across the state are going to be watching in the state. And again, we'll, we'll quote Shirley Liang again in her column. She hopes that it doesn't come to this because it shouldn't be a us against them. It shouldn't be town and city's rights against the state. We're all in this together. The name of the Commonwealth, we're called the Commonwealth because we want to share the wealth and the common togetherness that we have. So Milton's going to have to figure this out. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see what happens. All right. That was the uh, the big local vote this week. But there were some other big votes. Let's go to the House where the GOP-controlled House has impeached Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. It's just the latest chapter in the saga over immigration and border security. Um, Sue, this, this was to be expected once the House GOP had the math on their side. But, but what ultimately is, is the fallout from, from this? It, it just appears to me that the House GOP, the, the MAGA side of the House GOP at least, is on an island on its own because they, they've lost or it appears that they've lost a, a, a good portion of Republican senators in the House who had tried to strike this bipartisan, bipartisan immigration deal. Uh, and now the, the homeland, now those folks are going to have to deal with an impeachment trial and all that kind of stuff instead of actually solving the problem on the border. Yeah, this is the uh, Regina George moment from Mean Girls, where the Republicans just want to burn down everything that they have going on in Congress. They, they, they don't care. I mean, this impeachment was a farce. You can agree or disagree that he was doing his job or not doing his job, but in no way, shape, or form was any evidence presented or even any belief that there were any high crimes and misdemeanors, which is what the level is for impeachment. So American public, even if they are outraged about what's happening at the border uh, and are not MAGA supporters, see this as a waste of time and energy when we have a war happening with Israel and Hamas and we have the Ukraine and Russia war and we have a cliff coming where the, the government's going to have to shut down if they don't come to a budget agreement. And this is what they're wasting their time on. So within that, to, to your point, Corey, you now have the complete civil war of the Republicans happening, where the Senate Republicans are mad at the House Republicans because we could have solved a number of problems over the past three weeks. Uh, instead, we wasted our time. And within the House, you've got the Republicans fighting with each other. So again, this is supposed to be a put your best foot forward year because you're running for president and you want to take back the White House. And all they're doing is giving fuel to the Democrats to say they can't even give us something that they wanted that we agreed to sign. They're just shooting themselves in the head over and over. They're burning the whole place down and they're going to have to reap the consequences. Matt, Matt, what are you, what are your thoughts? You're obviously dealing with this, or, or dealing with the fallout of this uh, out on Beacon Hill, where everyone from the governor on down is just asking Congress to do something. 
Boy, I mean, just the words that you've heard from Maura Healy over the last few weeks since all of this started. I mean, you can just sense the frustration of having something on the table, something that could have at least assisted states like Massachusetts that have been dealing with the migrants that are flooding you know, into the country on a day-to-day -day basis and making their way to Massachusetts and being sheltered here. And Maura Healy has just said that she feels like she's disappointed with Republican leadership. There's many across the country that probably agree with her right now, but I think this is just sort of the messy side of politics as it stands today. And that, like Sue said, we're in a presidential election year and both parties are going to do what they think is best to try and make sure their guy either stays in the White House or their guy makes it into the White House. And so instead of choosing productivity, they're choosing to uh, just spin their wheels and do the things that they think will motivate their base to get out and vote. But boy, if you're Republicans and you're trying to make a case to Democrats who maybe aren't satisfied with President Biden or those moderates who maybe aren't satisfied either. I think it's really hard to make that case when you aren't willing to do the work of Congress, push bills across, make laws, and try and fix the problems that you say are so prevalent here in the country. Yeah, and I mean, it just it just seems, you know, I, there was a Ryan Nobles uh, with, with NBC did, asked a Republican congressman, how does, how does impeaching Alejandro Mayorkas help solve the problem at the border? And the congressman, the Republican congressman's response was, who said that this was meant to solve the problem? And so it just, it just kind of just, it's just naked partisanship, it feels like. And, and now it's, I, I think, any sort of negotiations that are going to happen, I, I don't know who's going to be in that meeting, because it seems like President Biden is done dealing with Speaker Johnson, um, who just seems so intractable um, when it comes to, to this issue, um, where it's not even, a, a, you know, trying to reach a compromise. It, it, it's, it's sort of a my way or the highway. And yeah, you might say he has he has some leverage on his side because he can say you're not getting any Israel or Ukraine funding without giving us something on border security. But at the same time, he has Republicans in his own party who are, you know, not sort of bending the knee to Donald Trump saying, "Yeah, we agree we should get something on the border if we're going to give them money for Israel and Ukraine." And that's what we did. Yet you won't even bring it to the floor for a vote. So, so it'll be interesting to see kind of where things go with here. And as Sue mentioned, now you've got uh, the, the looming government shutdown. And I believe a lot of House leadership on the GOP side is actually headed to a retreat in Miami for the week. So, so they're going to have a very limited calendar to actually get this thing done, um, which could mean a short-term funding gap bill, uh, which MAGA Republicans have said that they don't want to do anymore, um, or it could mean the government shutdown. So we'll have to see. But, but that, that issue... Um, Played, played out in, in New York, where we had the special election to fill the seat um, vacated by George Santos, um, Democrat Tom Swazi beating uh, Republican uh, Maisie uh, Pillip in that special election. And, and really, you've got two camps. You've got Democrats saying, we can, we can win this election even if people aren't so sold on Joe Biden. And then you have Republicans saying, oh, well, there's nothing to see here. It's just it's one special election. It doesn't really mean much for the, the presidential election. But, Sue, what it does mean is that Speaker Johnson and the Republicans have an even slimmer majority in the House to try and get anything done. Yeah, I mean, it's it's sort of amazing. I don't think anybody could have predicted this. They the the barely winning and keeping uh, the control of the House at the midterms. Uh, that number was lower than expected by, by a, quite a bit. And I, I think there was an expectation they would just hold on and use their majority to push things through. But instead, what you have is seats turning over, like the Santos seat, uh, back to its original owner. Uh, you've got people retiring. You've got uh, just this, this majority getting smaller and smaller. But I might argue, Corey, it doesn't matter. <laughs> because they had a majority and they weren't able to do anything. So it gets dangerously close to uh, a, 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 an idea that the Democrats could actually take control of the House, which would be a major disaster. I think that might be the death knell for uh, some part of the Republican Party if you end up with a Speaker Hakeem Jeffries because the Republicans were unable to keep the victories that they had. I mean, I just want to say I have a number of friends that I grew up with. I've known them my whole life. They're not very political, but they often will post something on Facebook like, look at them squabbling, those kids in Congress. Washington can never get anything done. They're always fighting with each other. But those posts have now taken a different turn, and it's the Republicans fighting with each other. They now see, in this situation, it's not 
all of the lawmakers unable to do anything. It's the Republicans, and it's it's such a dangerous time for the Republicans. I don't, I can't I don't even know how Mitch McConnell's able to sleep at night. Well, man, I know I know you know for somebody like like a Nikki Haley and in the Trump campaign are seeing this and seeing a Democrat who won this race by being a little bit tough on immigration, being a little tough on on Joe Biden and and, and flipping the seat. And I think they also see early vote turnout and mail in vote turnout and think. If the Democrats continue to just build up these large leads in early voting and mail in voting, and our and our folks just just stay home because they don't trust mail in voting, um, it's going to spell trouble come general election time. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think that's true. I, th- I think I think you do need to start to try to chip away into those different categories and start to try and speak a language that a lot of other people uh, can sort of embrace. You know, right now it's like, you know, Democrats, you can see, like you're mentioning, Corey, where they're starting to dip into topics that used to be just Republican talking points. In many ways, Republicans, I feel like, need to do the same thing. I think America as a whole, it's so partisan right now that I think a lot of voters are looking for those voices that are seeking compromise in some form or fashion. The question is, is whether or not candidates that do that can actually win. We've seen a couple of examples of it, but it's a question of whether or not a Nikki Haley can unseat a Donald Trump when she's using more compromise type language. And so it's a very interesting election cycle for a lot of reasons. We've said that it's felt like we're living on, you know, the moon when it comes to the New Hampshire primary. It's different. Everything is different. I think that's true. It's just a question of what it's all going to look like by the time we get to November. And Corey, I would make one more point, which I think is this really rich, ironic moment that the Republicans have for at least 10 years been saying there's a crisis on the border. They've been talking about caravans that did or didn't exist. They've been talking about uh, numbers that were increased when they really weren't. And they've actually gotten to a point now where the Democrats agree there's a crisis at the border. And the Democrats may actually be the ones who go in and swoop and fix or at least offer a solution to the crisis on the border while the Republicans are left out in the cold. That is how completely chaotic the Republican Party is right now. And I think, and I think they're also just sort of losing the, the battle on the ground here because we often hear, the, in terms of the economy, there's, we, need, we need more workers. We, can, we can't find you know, the workers. Well, here you have an influx of folks who, who, who want to work. Um, but obviously the Republicans will say, well, we, sh- we should leave these jobs you know, to, to the American people who, who, who do need them. Well, they're not being filled, uh, and, and, you know, unemployment, unemployment is, is down. So at, at, at some point, you're, you're, you're going to have to help us square this circle um, because obviously what's happening now at the border can, cannot continue. Um, but it, but as, as both Matt and Sue said, I think this will sort of be a issue that, that Democrats no longer have to hide from because you, have, you can have a governor like Maura Healey say, we, we dealt with the in, influx of migrants by making tough decisions, yes, but also helping these people, giving them work permits, allowing them to work, allowing them to sustain themselves, uh, allowing them to pay their taxes. Um, so I, I, it, it'll be interesting to see, you know, as, as we move forward, how, just how much the Democrats want to dive into that issue and use it. Well, and, and let me just say this, too. It is kind of bizarre when you think about the fact that you know, a year ago, two years ago, when Ron DeSantis was sending migrants to Martha's Vineyard, when Greg Abbott was sending migrants north to northern cities like New York and Boston, everyone at that time said, you're using these people as political pawns. And while that might still be true at this point, it worked, right? You got the attention of the Democrats. And now they're seeing this issue as something that's extremely important. So your political move, it worked. You actually got attention to your issue. You might actually be able to solve it. But because of how entrenched we are in partisanship right now, you can't move the ball over the goal line. It just, again, is just a microcosm of how frustrating the American political system has become at this point. Yeah, I, I agree. All right, uh, we got like two more minutes left. Anybody got any good tasting issue tidbits? I know Sue and I have been watching this uh, hearing down in Georgia involving uh, Fonnie Willis and uh, the, the special prosecutor in, in that case perhaps being kicked out of the case because of their their relationship. I'll just leave it at that. But anything else you guys are looking at? Well, I'm just not sure, Corey, yet if I should be paying off people in cash and not getting receipts or if I should be getting receipts. So we'll see how this this turns out to see if that was the right path yeah. for her uh, her friend to do. So I am riveted by it, as we both are. Anything you're watching, Matt, out there? You know, I, I don't know if there's anything that quickly comes to mind, but I mean... I don't know. I mean, it's it's exhausting. This whole season is just so exhausting. I mean, it's opening up all the apps every single day and seeing all the different topics, whether it's national, state, city, 
At least we work in Boston, right? It's never boring. <laughs> and what, we've got, what, less than two weeks until South Carolina? Yeah, that's that right. right. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And, so, uh, so we'll see. It's not really looking that great for Nikki Haley at the moment if you look at the polling. So it's yeah. really interesting yeah. to see if she can pull off her home state. How do, you, how do you lose to a guy who makes fun of your husband for serving his country? Right. But that's, that's the, the politics that we're in today. There we go. Because yeah. right, she wasn't good at saying thank you. So I'll say thank you to both of you. Thank you. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> All right. That is going to do it for this week's edition of Taking Issue. We appreciate you so much. You can join uh, Sue and I this Sunday for At Issue. We're talking taxes and to GOP Chair Amy Carnivale on the future of the Massachusetts GOP. Until next week, we'll talk to you later. Thank you.